I'm Alan Ross with EPRA, and this is another resource profile. Our guest today is Roy Huff of the Snell Group. He's one of the partners. They are a charter member of EPRA because Roy was there actually before the beginning at a workshop that he gave with uh, Adrian Messer of UE Systems on both ultrasound and IR, and he's gonna tell you a little bit about that. It was a brilliant workshop, totally integrated together, and that was just pure luck, right, Roy? But anyway, uh, it, I, I learned a lot. I had uh, Chip Angus of SD Myers with me, and it dawned on me there's so much more to this electrical system reliability than, than uh, I was even thinking about. And truly, Roy, that was the genesis uh, at least the spark for the thought of EPRA. And here we are almost a year later, and uh, we are an organization. You are a significant part of it. So thank you for joining us, and thank you for bringing the Snell Group with you. Uh, we appreciate it, Alan. It's uh, it's great to be part of the group and the organization. Um, it, it was a very interesting start in the introduction as you presented it. I had never thought of it in the perspective that you uh, that you brought to me and with that uh, i really had to step back and, and uh, think about it for a few minutes as to the fact that i've known it for years that uh, whenever it comes time to establish uh, uh, priorities and uh, establish uh, the criticality of equipment that the electrical infrastructure without it nothing else turns and uh, uh, you were bringing that to me and, and uh, suggesting that uh, that concept deserved an organization of its own. And so from my perspective, I was thrilled to be able to be part of it. Um, that, that particular uh, presentation was uh, something I'd never done before with, uh, with Adrian, though we've known each other for years. And uh, it was the first time you and I actually met as well and yeah. that turned into a great event as well so i think you'd introduced yourself during the uh, four hour long presentation right and you you endured the whole thing with us uh, so uh, adrian and i are never short of words with regards to our technologies um, it could be four hours it could be eight it could be a week um, and we'll still keep talking um, actually during that presentation is something that i didn't remember and uh, will always stick with me and it's actually become part of other presentations and part of our curriculum at some level was uh, your cell phone went off in the middle of my presentation but <laughs> yeah, it was a very yeah it was a very pleasant stairway to heaven and who doesn't like stairway to heaven a great song um, but i was able to uh, work it right into the presentation because i happened to be talking about uh, destructive tracking uh, and how ultrasound picks that up and what it sounds like and I made the comparison of it sounding like uh, death metal or very hard rock music, but death metal is a much better description. And then saying nothing like Stairway to Heaven. So uh, that was kind of our uh, interesting introduction to each other. Um, and it, I think uh, ever since then, we've been uh, going, uh, you know, just flat out trying to uh, promote the concept that you uh, introduced to me that day. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. It, you know, I'm the guy that says, everybody turn off your phones, and here I am. It was embarrassing. And then, of course, I'm fumbling to try to get it off, and uh, it, it, is, it is what it is. But I'm glad Stairway to Heaven is now, like, works worked its way into your lexicon. You know, Roy, one of the things I love, we talk about the seven fundamentals of EPRA, because um, since then, we've had to say, well, what do we stand for? What are we trying to accomplish? And we've kind of said there, these seven fundamentals are, we, we want them to be part of and parcel of uh, how we bring knowledge from the marketplace. Other people have an event, they have vendors, they bring in vendors, they serve beer, wine, and chicken legs. And uh, those of us who have been vendors, <clears throat> and you know this is true, we go to the reliability events and we wait for that time when people come in to get their beer, wine, and chicken legs. And we hope we get five to 10 minutes with them. And I wanted to change that. So we don't, we don't uh, really focus on the vendor part. Our resource practitioners, when we recruit them, and Roy, you were at the very beginning of this, you and Martin Robinson from I Iris, Alan Rainstra from uh, uh, SDT, I talked about the concept of coming in and sharing your knowledge in a different way. And it was like speed dating when we asked you to come to our conference, rather than you have to wait 
we sent uh, one seventh because we broke you guys up into seven groups. We spent one seventh of our conference attendees into each group for 20 minutes. And we did that pretty much for half a day. That was the most valuable part. This is what the members of the, the, the people that came to the conference said. That was the most valuable part. And Roy, you didn't you didn't really sell the Snell group, but you probably sold more of the Snell group. What did you do for that 20 minutes? You don't have to give us all 20 minutes, but talk no. about what you talked about. But yeah, it's we're in an interesting position as a uh, as a company in that uh, uh, we're vendor neutral. Uh, we don't work with any of the manufacturers of the infrared equipment, or the uh, we also focus a little bit on electric motor testing. Uh, we don't uh, represent any of those manufacturers. We are truly just a knowledge based company. So uh, for us to be able to participate in an event like that, it's what we do best. And uh, I don't want to sound like I'm blowing my own horn, but just simply to disseminate knowledge to support uh, this specific application of high voltage uh, reliability. Uh, it was just that. And it was a, a matter of, uh, for me, showing some examples, talking about the, uh, the pros. And one of the things I always focus on in almost all of my presentations is making sure that people know the limitations. It's not as simple as just going out and buying the piece of equipment. You know, when you put the, uh, the I'm going to use three parts. There's the people. You, your training focuses on the people. What do they do? There is the product, the, the tools that they used. And then there's the process for how you go about integrating the, the, all of those together. How you get the data. We're going to talk more about that uh, in, in a little bit. But one of the things that uh, struck me was, you. I, I'm going to say you're a purist. By that, because you're you are uh, a, a, an agnostic to anybody's equipment, you're really looking to advance the people to say, I don't care what tool you're using, I want to I want to help you be better at it, and then and then you train them up there. Um, part of what struck me in our when, what your training was about was the deep connection between reliability and safety. And I mean, that was both you and Adrian, that, that really hit me home more than anything. And since then at APRA, we've made reliability and safety just two sides of the same coin. And uh, we've had Ron Moore on with that, but talk a little bit about why uh, training is so critical to the safety aspect, which creates reliability, but they're, they are tied together. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that that's, uh, and, and to me, the simple fact that, um, EPRA acknowledges that and, and actually promotes that as one of the first uh, and foremost uh, with regards to protocol. So uh, it is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I have been involved in, uh, in issues. I've been in the electrical industry for over 30, 40 years now. Uh, so uh, the infrared for 30, but electrical for 40. Um, but that is a very interesting aspect. If we look at this, in, uh, when I first entered into the industry um, and started working with training and started uh, establishing uh, curriculum and that type of thing, and specifically we're headed toward arc flash events, and, and at least from my perspective in, the, uh, in these high, high, app, high voltage applications. Um, it was thought at that point in time in the mid 90s that an arc flash was approximately 12,000 degrees, um, you know, warmer or hotter than the surface temperature of the sun. With uh, new capabilities, we found out that uh, uh, if, if the surface temperature of the sun is not hot enough, um, it's really about three times that hot an arc flash event. And yet we were doing things uh, without procedures, uh, without protocol. Um, 2004, NFPA came in and released uh, their first attempt at safe work practices to mitigate arc flash incidents. They started, started to establish PPE or personal protective equipment guidelines. Um, and that happened in 2004 and they've improved it each year since. So all of these things uh, driving us to uh, establishing procedures, and alternatives to uh, the old school inspection of, of opening up high voltage equipment. Um, I, Ron Moore is a, certainly a, a, a great 
a resource for this and all of his statistics to support it in establishing the fact that uh, a reliable plant is a safe plant, and a safe plant is a more reliable plant. And that's, you know, one of his foremost messages in everything that he, uh, that he speaks to. Um, and again, I, my initial industry or my initial background was in an aerospace industry where we did everything we could to get something back online immediately. Uh, that was, uh, we were the best at reactive maintenance. And the issues there are, is that uh, in many cases, we may not do things in the best way. Reactive maintenance doesn't always have the right supportive procedures. Uh, shortcuts are taken. Uh, we may turn around and uh, getting something back online outweighs the risk considerations. And it's this combination of things, if we can move to a reliable, model and uh, that we can plan and schedule our work that uh, we're certainly going to improve our safety environment and yeah. um, again it, it's just crucial those two are hand in hand and when they're presented hand in hand uh, certainly i believe it it, it establishes um, in many cases the um, the importance of the or the prioritization of both because now i can I can sell reliability on the fact that it's going to make me safer, um, yeah. and I can, I can, you know, that that in and of itself is a easy decision to add reliable practices. So one of the things that we uh, another value uh, fundamental of APRA is the idea of continuous improvement slash innovation. I know that a lot of that's going on with products. Um, it's kind of hard to do with services, but but a lot of it's going on in the development of smarter products, um, uh, monitoring systems, those things. I want you to talk a little bit about how does that impact as you all uh, develop, because you do custom training, you go in and you do things for one company, which means you got to do a lot of listening and a lot of adjusting to, to fit their needs, right? Right, uh, right. Talk absolutely. a little bit about that whole idea of continuous improvement slash innovation as it relates to the content of what you train and how you train. So both the process and the content. Yeah, a great question or, or concept. And looking at that, uh, we are a training organization primarily, but we are also a, a significant consulting and we also act, offer the services as well. And so we, we see these from all aspects. And in looking at this, we've seen a, uh, an evolution due to the safety of the uh, increased opportunities for the use of infrared windows. Um, I, for a number of years, have been uh, pushing pretty hard on continuous monitoring because now we have infrared cameras um, in the price range of an, in, of an infrared window. So uh, why wouldn't we utilize this capability and continuously monitor something, bringing something out to a PLC or to a control room is simply an alarm setting to say, you know, something's out of uh, whatever our uh, compliance is. And we, from the standpoint of that, is, is I, I like to push that. I'm, uh, we're, it's, it's very interesting in trying to stay on top of things. It used to be more challenging than it, uh, than it is now because what used to take months to disseminate now within hours because of uh, you know the internet and, and other connections um, if you're not staying on top of this uh, you, you're left behind pretty quickly uh -huh. um, and so um, it is a, a, a certainly a progression of this is that uh, we used to open panels and then we installed infrared windows and that was a necessary uh, uh, time in there when that was our best option but i think that the what we're going to see in the future from this point on will be uh, continuous monitoring um, design, um, even built in, and we can certainly see in the in the switch gear and the high voltage components now. The manufacturers are finally aware of what's needed in the uh, in the field with regards to our access for testing, whether it be ultrasound, uh, infrared, um, or just visual, or even as I always point out in some of my classes, uh, even just. Uh, smelling the air, and I, I've smelled ozone too many times, knowing uh, uh, what's behind that panel, we're not opening it just based on uh, the air around it. We're, and of course, you could turn around and hear that with ultrasound as well. So we are always uh, on this uh, situation of uh, figuring out continuous improvement, how to deliver that message. We do it with webinars. We, I'm always rewriting curriculum as my all my trainers uh, 
grimace every time they get a new update because uh, we've added some new feature. And if you if you look at the things that have happened recently with the price of cameras coming down so much, um, the usage of drones increasing dramatically now that we can get the different inspection uh, angles on high voltage equipment as well. Um, something else that uh, motion magnification and uh, this is something that uh, you would think electrically. Well, yeah, and I've got some examples of that as well. So um, other manufacturers and equipment that we haven't even thought of using in a switch yard. Um, I've got images and, and proof that uh, there are oscillations of the ground created by plants moving electrical components and uh, or even wow. Yeah, or even the chatter, uh, we can slow it down and magnify it on uh, on contactors. And and so, you know, we think, okay, it's the combination of all of these technologies that's going to make us better. And uh, ultimately, going back to the first discussion here of, on this uh, short session of uh, the, the introduction of uh, ultrasound and infrared together, we've We've talked each other's game for years. Uh, the ultrasound and, and the infrared, they work beautifully hand in hand, not only high voltage electrical, but steam and, and mechanical, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I more and more for the past 15 years have actually have short segments of discussion of the utilization of ultrasound. We used to identify two failure modes in electrical equipment, and uh, those were the primary failure modes. Uh, but when you really dig down into it, there are about seven plus failure modes. And uh, of those uh, seven that we're really focusing on, ultrasound or infrared or the combination can identify those. So um, it's it's not that infrared's the only thing, and that's one of the things that comes out in our training is that uh, uh, whether it's uh, dissolved gas analysis uh, from the oil testing aspect of the uh, of the uh, transformers and the oil fields circuit breakers, it's bringing all those technologies together and making sure that the students know um, most of, mostly reliability is not this uh, one uh, one horse show. It's it's everybody yeah. working together. You have just given me uh, the the topic. It may not be the next uh, forums because you're on the next forum that we're going to be doing, but. Uh, you just give me a topic. I want to do one on bringing multiple uh, technologies together, <clears throat> and then have a forum and how how do they work together? How you know identify the seven and and which ones you know? Because that was another thing that struck me is how um, you you have mentioned this before, but how you, you and Adrian and and this could be true whether that was anybody in ultrasound or anybody doing that, but. You you came together um, and it was as if you guys had practiced this for a long period of time. I thought you had, and you were very honest. Now you just showed up. You did your powerpoints and you showed up. But it was amazing to me at how you talked about an integrated whole. And from from your standpoint as a training organization, um, that that just got to be. I mean, your mind has to open up as to what you can offer the marketplace because. That is the new future, that capability. So uh, it is. I, I, I assume you're doing more of those where you're you're doing joint training we, sessions now? Yep, uh, we, we've done it uh, two other times. Um, and uh, uh, we use each other's material with permission so that uh, we, when we're not together or we've got a shorter segment uh, that we can dovetail some information in. It's in a lot of our advanced curriculum in the from an infrared perspective, once you go to level two and, and on to level three classes and curriculums, um, I'm certainly pushing more that correlation of technologies. In level one, it's a little overwhelming to start throwing other technologies at, uh, at the student. Their uh, their heads are bursting with what I'm giving them anyway. So, but uh, once we get to level two, it's it's time to step up to the plate and realize that uh, it's the correlation of all this data that makes us best. So. So you you went you went right into this next one. We are very big on lifelong learning, lifelong sharing. Now you just talked about how you're continuing to learn and be at the forefront of these things, and that because you're a training company, you do a lot of that just naturally through the offering that you offer. But I also know that you know you give tips, you give things from your website, uh, and we're going to begin promoting those because there's some really good 
you don't have to go to training to learn something to go, oh, I didn't know, oh, I didn't know, you do that. But I wanna talk about, cause now we're gonna correlate between two of them, the lifelong, lifelong sharing we get. We are all working, trying to figure out, now you're younger than me, but I'm of the point now, I'm trying to get to the, the 40s and the 50 year olds to make sure that they got it and they're trying to get to the next generation. But when you talk about level one, level two, level three, it's always fascinated me in a world where um, I think younger people want to get there faster than maybe we did. You know, we paid our dues and we went up. And these young people is like, well, I got level one. Uh, aren't I now the head of reliability? It's like, no, <laughs> you're a level one. Talk a little bit about that idea of trying to pass on knowledge when there is a certain, I mean, they got to finish something to be level one certified, to be level two, to be level three. And you just talked about the, the difference in the advancement, but the impatience of all of us to get that next generation ready, because they're not ready and it's our fault. And I know you're one of the conduits, which we say, get them ready, get them ready. But how hard is it to get somebody to say, yeah, I've gone through level one and now I go practice it. And I come back and I get level two and I go, oh my gosh, I learn so much more than I go practice it. And then I got up to level three and I go practice it. How many people bail after level one because they just got a new job promotion? Talk a lot about, or a, a little about that generational yeah. change going through. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a, a kind of a combination of things there for me is uh, um, that, that one's a near and dear one to me uh, personally because I, I am of that older group now. You know, when I started, I wasn't the younger I didn't group. Say it. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but it's it's interesting is that um, we follow uh, an ASNT model, so the American Society for Non-Destructive Testing, which the, the model there supports three things, is that we will, uh, you'll have a, a set number of class hours, you will do, uh, uh, you will gain a set amount of experience based on hours, and then you'll do the appropriate testing for that. Now, many people want to do the testing right away. Um, and yeah. so there are certainly features and options, and uh, we really push people to use this model and, and use what's called a written practice to define what it takes or is required to be a level one, to be a level two, to be a level three. And it can be different for different industries. I work a lot in the aerospace industry. Uh, that's a, another area that I, I focus on heavily. Um, and so when things leave the ground, they have a whole different uh, level of uh, requirements with regards to the training and the experience, the hours of experience requirements. And they're very serious about it. We're not so serious about it in the reliability world. Um, someone could come to level one, take their test, um, have no experience, and then go right on to level two. There's nothing to stop them from doing that. Um, other than if the company, and it has to fall back on the company or the client, um, is using a model to support the proper approach, which includes that experience piece. Um, people can be great utilizing a camera and have no industrial experience at all to understand what the components are they're trying to identify. Mm, yeah. For example, you know, the overloads are hot in my motor starter. Well, they're normally warm. That's okay. The contactor's hot. Um, you know, the transformer's hot out in the, in the switch yard. Um, well, it, it's warm compared to the surroundings, and uh, that, that's normal, you know, and, and it's understanding these pieces. Um, one of the things from my perspective is um, I every class I teach, and uh, it's been a lot of them, but every class I teach, I learn something from the students every time. Yeah. And I'm always open to that, always open to that. As I walk away with a greater knowledge of their day-to-day -day experiences, their challenges, maybe whatever widget that they're manufacturing and sending out the door. Um, I, mean, I, I was like, how is it made? You know, I, I get to see that um, sometimes on a weekly basis of uh, a new manufacturing process or ways they've improved it or ways they've integrated infrared into their manufacturing process. Yeah. So those are fascinating for me. With regards to this generational transition, I, I guess I share from the standpoint, I'm in an interesting position is that uh, my youngest son is uh, finishing his electrical engineering degree this fall. So uh, he was an intern last summer uh, for a, a very large uh, uh, design firm. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. But he supported a substation design all last summer. So to me, that was very interesting and very, uh, you know, 
I don't know, like there's an opportunity to get his ear um, and uh, talk to him because I was H. And he's like, I go, he goes, what are you designing? And he said, a substation for outside of a, a large city. And uh, and he's doing his piece of it. He's only an intern. He's yeah, doing yeah. his little piece of it. But I said, uh, you know, that's probably replacing equipment that's 40 or 50 years old. And I said, so do you understand the failure modes of the new equipment you're installing? Do you understand these pieces of that? And so we had some pretty good discussions about that. In addition to that, I, I introduced him to EPRA and uh, he's a he's a student member now and i also Excellent. quizzed him a little bit about uh, how can we reach um, other kids as they're coming out of school like yourself i said you've had to put up with me for you know he's 23 now so for 23 years of, of looking at infrared images of stuff that he never thought about or thinking uh, thermally which is one of our catchphrases but uh, thinking thermally and, and hating me because of heat transfer concepts and physics but in a in a fun way but yeah, right. It's, it, yeah, it's interesting to try to, to get this and say, how do I get this into schools? How do we get this presented? And of course, your involvement and, you know, a little plug here, but your involvement in, in foresight and in involving University of Texas and that organization and that support, um, you know, they also uh, obviously are, are working with those people we're looking for and, uh, and right. hoping to get interested in this aspect of it is so important for where we are in the uh, in the electrical uh, delivery situation. So I I look at that as we we just have to keep pushing it out there. We also have to push it out there in ways that uh, the younger generation learns it. And what uh, you know what we've seen is putting more stuff online, putting shorter segments together, um, and uh, we're we're always going to be the ones that turn around and say that in person training is the best. But we also have to give options, and, uh, and it's options that are uh, affordable or free in some cases. Uh, those nuggets that uh, can go out and and prevent someone from making a, a mistake or you know a false positive, and uh, you know making those calls where we bring down a, a switch yard to make a repair that wasn't there. That there, there's no problem. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of different things about that for me as to. Uh, um, it's developing curriculum that's uh, attractive to the, the generation that is um, utilizing their cell phones more, you know, and, and pushing out our uh, uh, pushing out our messages and our tips so that they are formatted to read on a cell phone and those are just basics out there that we just have to do. Yeah, the, has your son got a job yet? Has he been offered a job yet? Well, he's uh, he was. The number one pick, but the particular company he's with is a hiring freeze due to our current uh, situation. So uh, he's he's hanging on out there. He's got a he, he won't graduate till December, but uh, he basically uh, he has a position as soon as they uh, remove their hiring freeze. But all right, well if they're <laughs> if they're too afraid to do it and they're chicken and you haven't mentioned who they are we can get him a job at a thousand other places because he's already way ahead of his peers by even thinking about this and, and having to add IR him when he was seven years old coming out of the bathtub. I bet. I bet. Yeah, you know, yeah you're exactly right. There's pictures of uh, him him uh, trying to explain why I'm, I'm a motorcycle guy and I've, tried, I've got him uh, on video explaining why the uh, why the uh, pipes appear cold, even though he knows if he'll touch them that they're going to burn him. You know, it's the emissivity yeah. issue at age six. Poor kid. <laughs> <laughs> Poor kid. That's exactly right. Okay, I want to I want to end this on uh, on an area. There's two things. One of them, we are. This is timeless. Uh, this th this will go on and it'll be recorded, and people ten years from now will see this. Uh, we hope because the principles that you've talked about for the Snell Group are timeless. I mean, lifelong learning, uh, safety and reliability, a vision for uh, that. So, uh, you know, teaching the next generation, those things are not going to go away. But we are in a time of COVID. So you've had to make adjustments. We all, yes, life training live is the best. That's the, uh, the capstone. But in a lot of instances, you haven't, haven't been able to do that. Talk a little bit about how you've made that adjustment to providing value, but doing a lot more of it online. Yeah, 
for us, of course, and I, no one could ever be prepared for what just happened. Um, so uh, we didn't we didn't see it coming, but we were fortunate in that um, industry and and had driven us to try to put more information online and to put more of our training courses online. So um, as fate would have it, we were maybe a little bit fortunate. Uh, it happens to be last December, um, prior to uh, COVID, um, I we only had uh, two classes online. And uh, last December, um, I did uh, three more segments and um, we just had them all recorded. So this is done in a studio, all recorded. And we put with this interactive stuff, quizzes, tests, exercises for the student to, to conduct and, and to practice. Um, and so, and we demonstrate all the concepts that we would normally demonstrate in an in-person class, but we do it all with video, uh, not voiceover PowerPoints, just uh, we actually do a video yeah. shoot in the studio. And uh, no one wants to sit and, and watch a computer for hours and hours, but you try to make it as interesting as possible. Again, that's short segments, you know, 10, 15, 20 minute segments so that you can take away key points and step out. Um, we had happened to have done that recording and what that allowed us to do was take what was going to be four separate two-day classes, um, specialty classes, electrical, mechanical, buildings, roofing, uh, modify them just slightly and also produce a level one class. So we ended wow. up with five, five courses online then. And I will say that I just got out of the studio about three weeks ago. I spent a week recording our level two curriculum. Um, I just rewritten it. So it's a brand new curriculum. Um, I just recorded it. It'll take us a little while before that's available online but we utilize the same concept as we've done with the other training. Those are packages that are gonna be simply on demand, you know, click and go. The other thing that we've had to do, and it's been very interesting as well, is we've done some live classes, not unlike what we're doing right now. Um, and in fact, I used my office with three monitors, two cameras, a flip chart, an infrared uh, camera, and uh, conducted uh, four hours of training. It was, uh, in the evening, based on the uh, time zone, but four hours of training for five straight days for a 20 hour segment of training. We're actually getting ready to do two more of those. One's 32 hours um, and another one's going to be 32 hours. And I'm not sure how we're going to exactly piece that together because no one can stare at a computer for you know six to eight hours a day. You just can't do that to someone. So uh, we are delivering live stuff. We are doing combinations where we've done uh, you do the uh, two-day on-demand, and we add a day. So we've done things to try to uh, to support that and uh, and looking at that. So our goal is uh, always out there to uh, to try to to uh, provide something uh, in the interim before until we can get back in person. And, and then you're gonna find it's still that. a model. That, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's still a model that works for those where the cost of the training, the cost of travel, which is significant. Yeah um where that doesn't work for smaller businesses now there's more options for them to be able to meet a level one requirement training requirement or meet a level two training requirement so i think the model. pivot that you did the pivot that you did in december that everybody else was forced to do in march in the, the COVID time um it's never going to go away you've just you've created the digital communication capability and here's something else you did. I want uh, the last thing I want you to talk about um, b before we end this is you mentioned early on that um, not only do you do training, but you consult with companies on training. The more that you put your your core, your basics in a way that can be delivered online and, and delivered well online, and have all of the other things, the eight eight minute segments, keep them there the more than Snell Group can focus on um, the consulting part, the helping people develop training programs to, to, to do a lot more. Uh, talk to me a little bit about your consulting. What does that look like? Yeah, most of our, it's very interesting, and this is also a lesson learned somewhat the hard way. Um, it took a little while for it to sink in for me, actually, and uh, we would uh, put on, and, and just to go back, with the, so. Snell's been doing classes uh, since the late 80s. <laughs> so, you know, we're looking at 34 years of, of delivering this type of uh, curriculum. Um, of course, there's 
updates all the time and everything like that. But with that in mind is, is that we love, we really fell in love with our level one class. We think it's just a great course. And we would get these students and they would come in with this new equipment and uh, so excited. And we would get them up to speed, getting great images. And, uh, and, and it was really interesting in that they were so psyched. And then the expectation was from their manager was, we sent you to this training, we got you this, this camera, um, now come back and implement a program. Well, <laughs> they were devastated, you know, overwhelmed. And, uh, and what we learned very quickly was, is that just because we had shared all this knowledge for a week with all these applications and all this camera operation and, and program information, um, that these guys would go back and uh, be faced with um, return on investment immediately in some cases, you know, and, and, and if you go back to the 90s, there was no, there was not a lot of model out there with regards to what a program looked like, you know, routine inspections done quarterly, what equipment's on route, are procedures developed, um, is an asset criticality assessment been done, all the pieces of the what I call the, the foundational elements of your, uh, of your program, those are not in place for these guys, um, or how to integrate them if they are in place, but only for vibration. And now I'm looking for electrical reliability. I, can I follow the same model? So our, our model from that came out of the fact of we're really it's program development. It's being able to walk down a facility, take, you know, how do you eat the elephant? You know, those things, one bite at a time, you're, you're not going to just take them all on. And uh, and that became an important aspect of all those components that I just mentioned. The other piece of that is, is we also do mentoring uh, where we'll go out in the field um, with the guys and maybe make their first uh, run through their electrical assets with them and uh, side by side and help them get an understanding of what they should be looking at or what they can safely access. Again, keeping in mind 70E. Uh, dictating uh, the accessibility of the equipment and, of course, safety first. And if there is issues, then we turn around and say, okay, this is a candidate for an infrared window. This is a candidate for continuous monitoring. Um, so those are some of the aspects that come out of our uh, come out of our consulting practices. Um, and that became an important piece. We still see a lot of people want to try it on their own, and uh, then they may come back to us. Um, but that we're always here for them. We, we provide, you know, phone support. As long as you don't ask me to write, uh, you know, a 20 page procedure on how to inspect something, I, you know, but if you ask yeah. our opinions, you know, people send in uh, images all the time and saying, have you seen this before? Um, or what do you think this might be? Um, and in some cases between our staff, we got a lot of gray hairs in my staff, but between us, we've probably seen it before. If not, you know, we know other people in the industry. So, if we can't uh, find an issue, we'll go out and find the answer somehow um, for them. So we, a lot that consulting piece takes up a, a big chunk for us, a lot of opportunity for us. Yeah, I, and um, you, you mentioned something, uh, having been in that world before, scope creep. You know, if people want for free something that they ought to be paying for, hey, could you uh, like put a program together, spend spend seven days of your life? And oh, by <laughs> the way, I'd like to pay you for a level one training course. Like, no, no, no. You need to pay for what you get. All of the uh, training that we're talking about, all of the Snell Group training is accessible through uh, my EPRA through, I and mean, it's not my EPRA, that's our website www.myapra.com um, and from time to time we will be putting snippets and some of the the free uh, ideas and, and things that uh, they have that many times can lead to somebody going I need more information because I did not know this and uh, that's a lot of what the snippets are about uh, they have a blog that we will be pointing to and posting to also last question for you we should all of us at this age be thinking about uh, the things of what we've done in this world in life is called stewardship. What happens after we're gone is what we did well in this life. It's called legacy. What do you? What is the legacy for the Snell Group and for you? That's a that's a good question. That's a great question. Yeah. So um, there's there's a lot of things. I, I guess I take away from this is um, I actually did a presentation at a conference uh, several years ago. Um, 
and the whole presentation was on what thermography could not do, uh, its mm. limitations. Whereas, you know, you would normally think someone's going to uh, promote the technology. I, I spent an hour beating it up um, and yeah. with good reason, because that's not always understood. The manufacturers and, and no, no reason about that. They're selling a great piece of equipment, but unless you understand the limitations of that equipment, some significant mistakes can be made. So uh, one of the things I would say I, I, we have pushed hard is is understanding the limitations. There's one other, there's a couple other topics that I always uh, are near and dear to my heart. And one would be uh, what I'm gonna say is temperature-based prioritization. Mm. So much of the industry, it's more common than it is not, but so much of the industry is going to base a phase-to-phase -phase temperature difference. They're gonna, they're gonna base the, uh, the criticality or the assessment of that simply on a number. All right. and, um, and that is a huge, huge mistake. So for 25 years now, uh, we've been working on models to support non-temperature-based prioritization, uh, a white paper that you can get for free. Um, and so those are things about it's understanding risk versus probability. Um, and it goes and it ends up sounding like a, an insurance plan, but it truly is that. What is the consequence of the failure versus what is the probability of the failure? Um, and yeah. it's putting those two together to establish a risk um, of which temperature is part of the, of the picture, but it's only a very small part. And I'll give a one quick example. I don't want to go on too long with this one, but um, a, a two or three degree temperature difference at the tip of a bushing on a transformer and the source of the heat is internal to the tank is catastrophic failure point. That's when yeah, you're going to immediately, you're going to immediately download or offload as much as you can off that transformer. You're going to immediately pull a dissolved gas analysis. Um, and you're going to hope that you are going to get out of this clean because, and it's yet it's, it's two or three degrees or even one or two degrees. Um, and yet I'm screaming about that temperature and most temperature based, that's not even on their radar. So yeah, um, that's one that I, I continue to run up the flagpole and say, listen, you can't base it on temperature alone. And so that's, that's one for me personally that uh, we tried to improve that model. And I think we have a pretty good model finally that, uh, uh that we're going to try to continue to push. And I we're, we're pushing against some big boys that have established some uh, temperature based stuff. And I, again, I'll remain name, nameless, but, uh, um, Temperature is part of it, but it's only part of it. Yeah. And I guess the last piece I want to throw out there, and it's it's one that uh, I kind of mentioned earlier, is is that uh, I, if I didn't mention the fact uh, that uh, we're continuously helping the world to think thermally, that's our registered trademark, to think thermally, um, I would be amiss. So that's that's one of the things. Of, there are so many visual indications out there of thermal events and. Uh, and if we are thinking about failure modes from a thermal uh, perspective, uh, we can look for all kinds of new ways to apply this technology. So those are those are a few things for me. So I have for for the new uh, ultrasound and uh, IR training together. You can go think thermally, act audibly. Anyway, that's just. <laughs> uh, no, I, I absolutely. If you look at all of our reliability, they are extensions of our senses. We're seeing yeah. infrareds, infrareds in a different wavelength than our eyes, ultrasounds beyond our hearing, vibrations yeah. beyond our touch. So it's it's always that, exactly, it is that uh, piece oh, of that. Oh, the olfactory, when you start to smell, uh, yeah, when you start to smell the ozone, uh, that, that's good. That is a great paper, my friend. You ought to be writing that <laughs> one right now. Anyway, this has been a resource profile with one of our charter members at EPRA. Uh, I cannot recommend their training uh, more highly because I know what's behind it and I know the purpose behind it. And uh, in many cases, uh, you, you probably will never know this, this side of eternity, uh, Roy, but there are people that are alive today because of the way that you trained them uh, that would not have been alive had they not been trained well. But thank you for what you do. Uh, thank everybody at the Snell Group. This has been a resource profile with the Snell Group. Thanks, Roy. Thank you.